Um, thanks, Charles, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, touching on a very controversial topic here. Okay, so my name is Anshul Vikram Pandey. I, uh, this is the work I did with uh, four of my collaborators from New York University, uh, Catherine Narell, Margaret Satter White, uh, Odette Now, and Enrico Bertini. And uh, the paper is titled, How Deceptive Are Deceptive Visualizations? An Empirical Analysis of Common Distortion Techniques. So before we move further, let's take a step into a simple world that once existed. So in this simple world, we had a data table. Here I'm showing you the age data of two lovely ladies, Mary and Jane. And in this simple world, if you were asked a question regarding the, the, the shown data, which is something like, how much older do you think is Jane as compared to Mary? And if you're given four, four options to choose from, it is very likely that your response will fall in, in the following box. Then we entered the realm of data visualization. The word is state simple still. And even in this word, if you ask the same question again, it is very likely that the response will not change a lot. But if you see here, things are, you, you now have lots of, uh, a, a lot more knobs to, to tweak and play with. For example, you now have an axis. And this is where things start getting interesting. So what happens if you start playing with the axis and change the axis which goes from 0 to 100 to 44 to 52? And now if I ask you the same question again, it is very likely that your response is maybe it's significantly older. Right? Now that said, what's interesting here? The interesting thing here is that we did not change the underlying data at all. The only thing that we changed was visual representation. Which brings us to a very interesting question, which is, can we steer users' response without changing the underlying data? Or, to make it more precise, can we change users' response by showing them deceptive visualizations? So one may ask, what do you mean by deceptive visualization? And we took uh, some, uh, we adopted this definition from, from some literature in deceptive advertising, uh, where we define deceptive visualizations as a graphical depiction of information designed with or in, without an intent that may create, uh, with, with or without an intent to deceive, that may create a belief about the message or its components, which varies from the actual message. Now, if you look at the components one at a time, what does it mean, a graphical depiction of information? In a way, we are covering the whole space of information visualization. Second, which is designed with or without an intent to deceive, it means that we are not going to discriminate between the deceptive visualizations, which are deceptive because of the visual illiteracy of the designer, or because it was designed with an, ex in, with an explicit intent to deceive. The third and fourth point, uh, which basically talks about the message interpretation, so not quantitative estimation, but qualitative interpretation of the underlying message. So with this in mind, with this definition in mind, we started looking for some real world examples, and we came across quite a few. So these are some of the real world examples uh, which we collected from Reuters, Fox News, even from White House. Uh, and uh, each of them employ a different dis distortion techniques. So when I say distortion techniques, I'm basically referring to the tweaks that you can do on top of your, your representations. Now let's look at some of these examples. It's not very clear here. So let's look at this example, right? So in this example, uh, we have a bar chart where the y-axis starts with 34%, right? And now if you are going to compare the 39.6 with 35%, it looks like 39.6 is at least five times bigger than 35. That's plain wrong mathematics. Now let's look at another example. Here, this visualization comes from Reuters. It talks about um, a, a law which was enacted by Florida government, which is called Stand Your Ground Law. And they were trying to proposed the idea that this law is actually effective in order to, that, 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 that is basically leads to a decrease in the number of crimes, right? So if, as you can see, uh, on the x-axis, which is on the top, the, you have the number of committed, uh, so on the x-axis you have the time frame, on the y-axis you have the number of committed crimes. But actually the chart is upside down. So it looks like at a glance that when the, the law was enacted in 2005, the, the crime rate decreased substantially, it's actually the other way around. Now, we, we collected quite a few of these examples, and we started open coding them. And these are the four com most common distortion techniques that we came across. So here, we, you see four quadrants. Each quadrant represents one distortion technique. Each 
uh, quadrant also contains two charts. The chart on the left is the ideal uh, correct representation. The chart on the right is the distorted representation. So for, for example, let's, let's talk about the truncated axis. So in, in truncated axis distortion, this is similar to the bar chart that we saw earlier. So you change the scale. Uh, in area as quantity, in the correct representation, you are mapping area directly, uh, you're mapping quantity directly to the area. In the distorted version, you are mapping the quantity to the, set, let's say, the radius of the circle. So you're increasing the area substantially. So the, 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 the visual ink is increasing substantially. The aspect ratio distortion, you are stretching or, or, or shrinking one of the axes, which basically means that you are affecting the, the angle of inclination or declination, and in turn, affecting the, the message uh, related to the rate of increase or decrease of any quantity. And the last is inverted axis. This is again similar to the Reuters example I just showed, where you are trying to actually invert the whole message. You're not really affecting the, the extent of a message. Now, if you think carefully, each of these four distortion techniques actually lead to one of the two types of deception. So either the, the deception is related to the message exaggeration or understatement, that means you have a message, you are want to just exaggerate that message. Or your, uh, your distortion is leading to a message reversal where your message was one directional and you are just reverting the, the whole message altogether. Now with that in mind, what kind, of, what kind of questions you would ask your users in order to, to capture this kind of deception? So for message exaggeration or understatement, you would end up asking how much uh, type of question so that you can basically capture the extent of a change that the user feels. Um, for message reversal, you would ask what type of questions and you would provide maybe a correct and incorrect uh, uh, interpretation of the message and then you can capture, capture user's response. And that said, we segmented our broader research problem into three finer and smaller research problems. First was, does the use of distortion technique actually lead to deception? We don't know yet. I mean, we all talk about it, but there is no empirical evidence yet. And if yes, how deceptive are these techniques? And the second point, uh, the third question was, does individual difference play a role and whether it actually moderates user response as well? And we'll talk about how we define individual differences here as well. Now, in order to answer the first two questions, it is very important to learn, to understand, uh, or to find a way to measure deception. So we decided that, uh, we decided the following approach. So we decided to show the users either a deceptive or distorted or non-distorted version of a visualization. Now, based on what kind of visualization the user saw, he, we would ask him a how much or what type of question. Now, for example, if we just uh, think back about the same Mary and Jane example, I would ask, how much do you think is, Ma is Jane older as compared to Mary? And you, I can uh, collect your response on a five-point Likert scale, which is, again, a qualitative interpretation, non-quantitative estimation. So it can go from not older at all and significantly older. Or I can ask you a question, something like, what can you say about the ages of Mary and Jane? And I can give you a correct interpretation, which is Jane is older than Mary. I, I can give you an incorrect in interpretation, which is Mary is older than Jane. Or I can just say that, okay, I'm not certain at all. Now, to answer the third question, which is how to measure individual differences, I'm not going to go into the, the, into the details because it's a bit more involved. But we basically segmented the individual differences component into four broader sections. First was the user demography information. Second is user's familiarity with the shown chart. Third was user's visual ability in order to process visual information. And fourth was the need for cognition, which is a, a psychological uh, concept uh, proposed by Petty and Cassiopo uh, a while ago. So I would really encourage you all to, uh, to read the paper to actually go know more about the individual differences component. So this is how our setup looked like. We conducted crowdsourced studies with 330 participants, uh, two different types of deceptions four different types of distortion techniques, and uh, eight different kind of treatments, one each, one control and one deceptive for each of the distortion techniques. And this is the pipeline that the users went through. So uh, here you can see that there are five stages in the pipeline. The first, second, and first, second, third, and the last stage correspond to, correspond to the individual differences. Uh, and the fourth stage is where we actually detect collect user's response uh, in order to measure deception. 
So once the user provides us uh, the demographic, demographic information, uh, takes part in the chart familiarity questionnaire, and uh, goes through the visual ability questionnaire, we assign treatments. So we assign one of the following eight treatments to the user. So in our study, around 40 to 45 participants were assigned to each treatment. And based on what kind of treatment the participant is assigned to, he, we, pro, we pro, provide one of the two kind of questions, which is either how much type of question or what type of question. And we also ask uh, attention check questions. So this attention check question is actually a factual question related to the data that was shown. So we, are, we only uh, analyze the response from the users who pass this attention check. We'll not talk about the, the results of our study. So let's first talk about the message exaggeration and understatement. What happened when the users saw one of the three types of distorted charts? Area aspect ratio, area as quantity, and truncated axis. So each of these distortion techniques lead to message exaggeration or understatement type of, uh, type of deception. So the, on the chart that you see here, on the x-axis of this chart, you have average user response on a five-point Likert scale. Again, this is a qualitative interpretation. So the numbers one to five actually correspond to user's choice, but they are not actually the numbers that the user chose. On the, y on, on, on the horizontal panels, you have individual distortion techniques that we used. As you can see, when, as you can see on, on this chart, every time the user was shown at the deceptive chart, his response swayed quite far from the actual response when, when, he, when he was shown a, a control chart. So here, as you can see, the 95% confidence intervals don't overlap, and there was quite significant uh, uh, effect of uh, the choice of treatment on user's response, which basically uh, confirms our first question or answers our first question, which was, can we steer user's response just by changing uh, the, the visual representation? Now, what happens when the user saw uh, message reversal? So on this chart, on the x-axis of, of this chart, you have the type of visualization that the user saw. Sorry, the font is too small. On the y-axis, you have the number of participants. Right? The blues are the correct response, the reds are incorrect response, and the orange is the uncertain response. It is quite evident here that when we showed the, corrected, the correct representation of the data uh, without any distortion, most of the users got the message interpretation correct. Right? The, the blue bar is, is much uh, taller than the red bar. Whereas when we showed the user the deceptive visualization, like the inverted axis visualization, their response was, the, the, their interpretation was largely incorrect. Uh, so the interpretation of the message was largely incorrect. Let's talk about the third question, which was, does individual differences affect user's response? So here this chart helps us to basically try to answer this, this problem, but it's not super clear yet, and I'll tell you why. So as you can see, there are four charts each four smaller charts, and each smaller chart corresponds to one of the individual differences factor. Um, we, don't, we only uh, show the charts where you saw some interesting patterns or some uh, significance test. So there is no gender and there is no age here. So on the y-axis, again, you have the average user response. As you can see, that th for the first three charts, there is no clear trend, right? So, but, and, and we also show the 95% confidence intervals where there is very less or very less overlap between the, uh, co the confidence intervals. However, for the need for cognition, we did see a clear trend. Like every time the need for cognition was, was high. So on the x-axis of each of these charts, we have the segmentation of the factor into high or low. So you, should, you will have to go through the paper in order to understand our heuristic in, in segmenting high education and low education, high visual ability and low visual ability. But in a way, this chart at, uh, at a glimpse shows that, for example, every time a user had high visual ability and he was shown a bar, a drunkard access distortion, he was less prone to deception as compared to when he had low visual ability. But again, we, we refrain from making some strong conclusions because first is that there are no clear trends, and second is that the places where we could see clear trends, there was no significance, uh, significant effect. So, so yeah, this actually opens a really interesting scope of future work as well for us. But before I end, I would, talk, I, would, I would like to talk about the implications of our work and why it's really important at this stage. 
So first thing that we wanted to do while we were collecting all these examples was we wanted, we, we realized that there is this very dire need to provide some sort of guidance to visualization designers. There are big firms and organizations, including White House. I mean, we don't want the president to call for a new attack because he saw inverted access chart, right? So in order to, to avoid this kind, of, uh, this kind of traps, we wanted to minimize at least the unintentional deception that, that occurs because of the visual illiteracy or because of some issues. And only when we are, we, we can, only when we resolve the first three components, we'll be able to talk about the ethical considerations in, in visualization design. The second thing that we wanted to do was empowering our policymakers and readers. So we collaborated with a group of human rights activists, and we saw the kind of data that, that they see almost every day. So every day they have charts and data coming from different sources, and they need the ability to spot the deception, deceptive visualizations or, or the fallacies in the charts. And in our initial pilot studies, we actually saw that they were unable to identify some of these finer uh, deceptions in, on, on the charts. So we want to empower our readers as well as the policymakers whom we, we work with. And the last thing, uh, which was very interesting, so uh, a month ago, one of our co-authors wrote a blog post uh, about, about this paper. And uh, recently, we started lots of people, uh, we started seeing lots of traction on, on this work. So yesterday, I just took this screenshot of, uh, so if you just search for, for our paper, there are, there are so many forums, even Reddit, people are talking about different vi deceptive visualizations that they even find in their textbooks. So which is really interesting because now people are actually, uh, people know that there is something that's wrong and they should be worrying about this thing. Uh, and, and we are just excited that uh, there is, there we are getting some attention from the community and that was largely the goal of our work as well. So before I end, I would like to thank our collaborators, um, our uh, funding agency and uh, the good Turkers who took part in this really exhausting study. And uh, I would like to end with the really interesting, uh, amazing quote from the Spider-Man 1 movie, which says that with great power comes great responsibility. So visualize carefully. Don't deceive. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to take questions now. Um, TJ from University of the Philippines. Um, I have a question, though. Uh, would you mind if there would be some sort of a guideline also for us researchers, because I think we might have fallen also into the mistake of doing also deceptive visualization on our, let's say, data showing like, hey, it works, but you know, it's not significantly working, but that's the thing. Yeah, so definitely a really good question. and. Uh, I mean, if you just pull any paper, most of the time you'll see the y-axis is starting from where you want to show the highest emphasis, right? So definitely, the, the, eventually we would like to frame some sort of guidelines, and that's also part of our future work. Uh, what we are trying to do next is, again, figuring out what's the best approach to streamline uh, these deceptive visualizations, streamline this process of identifying what's wrong with visualizations, because we can't really just sit back and think of open coding there should be a, some, some sort of an automatic way in order to understand what kind of visualizations are, are wrong, right? So once we have that kind of uh, uh, resource set up, we'll be able to identify or, or we'll be able to basically figure out a ni nice guideline for, for our researchers to basically use while creating visualizations. So yeah, thank you so much. Hello, Catherine Plaisant, University of Maryland. Thank you, this is very fun. I was wondering if, uh, since you did the study, if you feel like you, there are other types of 